much for joining, Andrew. Oh, thank you so much, Joy, for having me today. Really happy to, to be here. It's wonderful to have you. And uh, you're going to give us a little virtual immersion tour mm. sample like you do with your guests a little bit later. Mm. But before we dive into that, can you tell us a little bit about how you got interested in garden design, a little bit of your background, how you ended up doing this amazing job? Yeah, uh, well, it's kind of a long story, but I guess it started off. I, I was really young. I was living. Uh, I grew up on the east coast of the U.S. I was really interested in nature and in art. Uh, and early on in my life, he be also became interested in Eastern philosophy, um, which was kind of an interesting situation. But uh, yeah, I followed all of those interests into, you know, eventually becoming an adult and figuring out what am I going to do in my life. And I uh, figured out to become a landscape architect with a really kind of deep interest in Japanese gardens. I can see some images there. Yeah, um, yeah. so I, I became a, a landscape architect. I, I moved out to Colorado. I worked for an amazing company um, called Marpa, um, which at the time was owned by a um, American Zen monk who also has his own garden company. Um, his name is Martin Musco. And I don't think he's here listening, but if he is, hello, Martin. He was a huge uh, impact in my whole life. And we're still, you know, really in touch. Um, it's great to, to be connected with him. But yeah, he uh, brought me into his company. I worked on multi-million dollar uh, gardens in the US. Some were um, Japanese style gardens. Some were uh, more kind of Rocky Mountain, Colorado gardens. Uh, but for about 10 years, I made really large scale, high end. Many of them were multi-million dollar uh, gardens. Uh, but I always wanted to come to Japan and uh, experience life here learn from the the traditional masters here and and spend time in the the gardens of kyoto you know kyoto is really the the japanese garden capital of the world and i i always felt like this is the place i had to be even though i really didn't know anything about kyoto other than there was gardens here and so uh i left a pretty good career in the u.s to come to kyoto um i knew no japanese i didn't have any connections i didn't know anything really and uh eventually found my way into one of the highest ranking garden companies here, a company with uh, 300 years of, of, of history. And um, yeah, that was amazing. I, I got to learn from the masters. I got to uh, be exposed to many different, you know, landscape uh, designers. I, I went to a, a, a through a one year program here in Kyoto. Um, that was kind of like a, a master guard. It's run by master gardeners. It doesn't really make you a master gardener after one year, but you get exposed to a lot of amazing teachings. And um, I went through that one year program. I worked in the company for several years, and then I made my own small business uh, working in the gardens, but then also leading walking tours of uh, many of the amazing gardens. And the work I do is really kind of to stay away from the musty, well-known spots here. I think anyone could really just find those on their own. Uh, I bring my guests to the much uh, quieter parts of Kyoto, where we can you really feel a the energy. beautiful logo, a beautiful yeah. kanji character. <laughs> Tell us about your logo yeah. for your business well, on Design Kyoto. Yeah, if I just reach out over here, this is kind of actually the original <laughs> calligraphy. Oh, beautiful. It's kind of mirrored. Oh. Did you do that? Uh, no, definitely no. This was done um, by, a, a, I'm being mirrored here, so I'm trying to figure out which way is the, okay, here we go. That'd be something like that. That's the good way. Um, but this is actually a really common Japanese character that I think most people, when they see this, cannot <laughs> understand what this actually is, because this is kind of like the old way to write it. Um, this is the character An or Yasu. Um, which, you know, Yasui, something uh, sometimes it's, you know, referred to as being, you know, low price or cheap. Um, an, another way of pronouncing Yasu, is a way to describe uh, something calm or peaceful. But uh, when I first came to Japan, I was given my kanji. My name is Andrew in Japanese, but it's pronounced Andoryu. And a ex-monk turned guest house owner <laughs> chose those kanji for me 
uh, An is the first one that you see there. Um, and that became when I started my garden company, my, you know, many garden companies here are just named after the owner. And so my nickname when I was working in the traditional garden company uh, was An. Uh, nobody really wanted to say An Doryu, it's kind of long. And so I just became An Chan. And uh, so when I started my company, I thought to call it An Design. Um, and the logo was written by a friend of um, the family, uh, my wife's family who um, is a calligraphy artist. And he wrote out a few of them and we chose this one. Uh, but the term on design, you know, this my company started off as a garden company and it kind of morphed into a garden slash tour company. And so I think for, as a tour company, it's kind of hard to, people don't really understand like how does design work with tours? Oh, it's so, it's yeah. so important when you're touring gardens for sure. Yeah. And there's, there's so many things that I, I'm so happy to, to connect with you because mm. there's so many things about Japanese gardens, which you can look at and appreciate, but without understanding on a deeper level, I think you're missing out on so much. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's wonderful to hear that you're doing these immersion guide tours. Like for example, uh, mm -hmm. when I look at this beautiful rock Zen garden, I, I yeah. wonder and I marvel at how much time it must take to, to rake these rocks in such a beautiful oh. way, but I know nothing about yeah. the, the underlining meaning of it. Mm. Well, that's really the work that I try to do in my walking tours is, and the way that I, I, I explain them, you know, when, when visitors to my website, you know, might check out my website, the, 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 the way I try to explain what I do is that, um, you know, when you come to Japan, you're inevitably, especially Kyoto, you're going to walk through temples and, at the temples, you know, the buildings are usually surrounded by gardens. And so you're almost guaranteed to spend, to find yourself in a Japanese garden when you come to Kyoto. And I know a lot of folks just like you, Joy, you know, they come here, they think it's just amazingly beautiful, just majestic. You couldn't imagine a more peaceful environment. But then your mind starts racing, like, you know, what's actually, why do I feel like this? What's going on here? What is this element? What's that? What does this mean? What is it supposed to mean? What is it not supposed to mean? What am I supposed to do? What am I not supposed to do? And so the work that I do is to really, you know, guide my guests through these spaces, really pointing out elements of the history, the design, the 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 practice, the Zen practice that goes along with this and and the symbolism, which um it could be said is quite rich in these gardens. You know, these are many of these gardens you find at Zen temples and the, at the Zen temples are where there are monks training, practicing, you know, to, to reach enlightenment. And so these are enlightenment spaces. It's not uh, really about entertainment or just, uh, well, there's a lot going on, you could say. And, um, and so that's what I try to share. And so what you specifically mentioned about the, the rake sand, I mean, yeah, that takes a, a tremendous amount of time. And, and spaces like that would typically, historically, you know, be raked every morning by one of the monks, you know, as part of their spiritual training. It's like a, a, a meditation in motion, um, clearing the thoughts out of the mind and just being present in this moment and and what you do is you, you're you constantly walking backwards, you're raking the sand uh, very silently, very, you know, in a very kind of, how would you say, very, you know, intentional position you find yourself in. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not like the monks mess up and then they sweep over it and they start again. It's really meant to be one continuous uh, uh, motion. And, you know, really one of the most important things you have to keep in mind is you don't want to rake yourself into a corner because <laughs> then you have oh. to walk through what you just raked. <laughs> it doesn't work is out. It, is it like when you study martial arts that the practice of doing garden, garden, like Zen garden maintenance is supposed to be meditative? Mm -hmm. And are you supposed to be like thinking about certain things or clearing your mind as we often try to do in yoga? Totally. Is that a part of the training? Totally. Well, I don't, I've never done any martial arts training, so I, I can't exactly say it's like that or not like that. But from what I imagine, 
Um, well, yes, just to answer your question, yes, it's very much meant to be a meditative act. And so, you know, think, well, what's the point of meditation then you have to get into? What does that even mean? Um, the idea of meditation is to be present. And by being present, what you're doing is emptying everything out of your mind. And the idea then is that you don't just, you know, you're not experiencing nothingness. Um, it could be said you're experiencing everythingness. <laughs> you know, in this moment, you are totally present. And so there are, there is no limitations. You understand that, that the energy that flows within you, it, it's just never ending. It's, it's the power. It's all powerful. And so the idea of, of being present, that, that's what Zen practice very much is about, is, is um, removing all of the, the kind of things that bind us down and, and kind of hamper our, you know, free lives and our happiness and, and, and being here in the moment always. And so, yeah, when you're, when you're let's say, uh, writing calligraphy, you know, you have to be present in that moment uh, when you are practicing the tea ceremony. The tea ceremony is very much a, a meditation shared by, you know, several people. Flower arrangement is said to be, um, you know, an act like this uh, painting. And uh, the garden maintenance, you know, it, it's very repetitive. It's very mundane work, but it is a way to uh, clear the mind and, and understand your interconnected nature with all things around you. You know, it's, it's kind of a weird story, but, you know, one time I was up in a tree and I was just clipping the tree and it just seemed like endless clipping. And it was kind of early in the morning and, 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 um, what, maybe it was around 930 in the morning, you know, the, the town was still kind of waking up in a certain way. And I was up on the tree and I was just, you know, my hands were touching the branches. I was clipping the each branch, you know, one by one. I could hear the sound of the bus and I could hear the lady, you know, up above nearby, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, the sounds when people, you know, are on the balcony, like uh, shaking out the, the, the futon. And, you know, I heard the birds chirping and I felt the sun and it might sound very strange, but in that moment, like I just completely detached from myself, you know, my ego and, and could feel all of us, everything together in that one moment. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what the garden maintenance is really about, you know, clipping the trees, pulling the weeds, raking the sand, whatever you're doing, it's meant to be. Um, uh, a meditative act. Yeah. Because so cool. you can imagine what doesn't happen, yeah. right? If you don't tend to the garden, it's just like if you don't tend to your mind, if you don't take care of yourself, if you don't, you know, work on, on, on your happiness and controlling your thoughts and being positive. If you don't work on these things, it could become a mess. And the same in the garden. If you don't pick the weeds, if you don't cut the, the, the shrubs, you know, eventually the paths you know, you can't move through the paths and there's thorns and prickly things and, and just being in the garden becomes very difficult, it becomes overrun by, you know, unnecessary things. And so uh, that's, that's how the garden work translates to the, the mental aspect of it. And I, I appreciate all of the work that goes into making these beautiful gardens, pristine and so natural. And what I appreciate more and more is the absence of plastic and the oh. use of natural materials together. Mm -hmm. You know, like in so many parts of Japan, we have too many plastic cones everywhere. I don't <laughs> see that in traditional gardens. Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, but here, tell us about this uh, technique that you're using. I assume <laughs> you're moving some heavy rock or something yeah. into position. Yes, this was actually one of my first days on the job, and I was completely blown away. Uh, and you can't see it, but, uh, you know, we see the back of his head. This is Inoue Sensei. Uh, he's one of the really highest ranking garden masters in all of Japan at the moment. He, he recently retired and passed um, the, the company down to his son who I think now it's 29th or 30th generation uh, but I got to work with him for a couple of years and that was absolutely amazing uh, 
so what we're doing here, <laughs> you know, this is a, a really old property. And, you know, back in the US, let's say, the, on the side of the building, it'd be very wide. Uh, there probably would be a fence around it. And if we were doing the garden renovation, we would just kind of remove sections of the fence, bring in the bobcat or the, you know, the backhoe and we'd have all the machines and, and we'd just start plucking the stones around and it just would be like, poop, 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 poop. But in Japan, it's very different, you know, next to the, 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 you know, you might have this much space to move through on the side of the house. And if you have a really nice fence, you know, a nice bamboo fence, you're not going to just start taking it apart if you don't have to. And so in this situation, there was like a truck crane on, on next to the property on the road on the other side of the fence. And, you know, back in the U.S., I can't really remember, but maybe we have these. It's a, it's like a flatbed truck that, that has a crane arm attached to it. And the boulders came on that flatbed. Oh, I'm just thinking of it strangely. Actually, no, those were the trees that we picked up and pulled over the, <laughs> over the, the fence onto the property and then moved around. The, the stones actually we pushed on a dolly that was, uh, took a lot of work to get it back there. But then we get the, the, the stone onto the ground. We have no machinery. And so we use this tripod-like contraption called a san mata. And the tripod has this, uh, uh, what would you call this? <laughs> I forget what you, you know, the, the chain uh, attached to it. And, like um, a lever or something? Yeah, else? yeah, yeah. And, and you chain the, the, the stone and then you pull it up. And uh, then as it's hanging, you push the stone all the way into one direction as far as you can in the direction you want to move it, and then you lower it down. And then you keep, have to go, keep going, and so you move the legs as much as you can as the stone's on the ground, and then you set the legs again straight up, and then you pull it up, and then you push the stone again. <laughs> and then when you get it kind of as far as you can, then you lower the stone down, and then you move the legs again, and then you get it to where you want to set it, and then you uh, finally uh, set it into place. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And uh, I was surrounded here by some really awesome uh, gardeners. I mean, these guys are just amazing. That's uh, incredible. Really yeah, incredible. when when I do um, even short walks and do the live stream, there's so many fans around the world who always comment on the high quality of maintenance mm. of the landscape artists and the gardeners. Mm. I think it's Japan is so famous for such high quality work, right? Yeah, well, are what's... you using special tools as well? Is it oh, totally. Japanese? style tools? Oh, yeah, all traditional style tools. You know, the company that I was working for was really high level. And so they insisted that we use the more traditional style tools. Nowadays, you can find, you know, uh, companies that aren't working in such high end gardeners, maybe gardens using much uh, more modern style tools. But yeah, all the, um, the, the scissors that we use, the saws that we use, the double-handed scissors were all of the traditional type. And, and I'll tell you, Joy, what's really interesting here is that, you know, that garden that I was making in the, in the previous photo, that was kind of one of the few chances I really got to make gardens here because a lot of the maintenance, a lot of the work here in Japan, especially in Kyoto, in the garden industry is actually maintaining the gardens. So doing like what we can see in the photo here when I'm kind of... Um, squatted down you're clipping the, the the plant there um there's really not a whole lot of garden construction here because the temples are very old and they have their gardens the uh old residences all have their gardens and so you know the work in those spaces is to maintain them and you know nowadays if a home is built it rarely has any garden around it the home is built to the property line and so a lot of the work these days is maintenance. And so that makes uh, sense. You could see what I, I was doing. I love here. your tabby yeah. boots here. I have to yeah. shout out to the tabby boots. Yeah, these are kind of special ones because these are actually steel toed, which are really oh. uncomfortable because, you know, they're, they're steel in here and it really makes it rigid and it's not very malleable at all. And uh, they hurt. But for this project we were working, it was a. Uh, um, it was, a, it was a very large project, actually, at a cemetery. We were making a very large garden. 
And for this part of the project, we were doing stone setting and they required that we wear those steel toed tabi, which... <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, the idea is that with the tabi, you would have more grip strength or be right. able to move your foot better, totally. I guess. Yeah. So typically, like if you were to wear that steel toed version, you would not be like climbing trees and cutting them because that's when you really need your feet to be able to kind of uh, mold onto the tree. Um, this you would pretty much only use when you're doing uh, heavy stone setting. And if I remember correctly, this was kind of in the winter. And so those were actually, they would kind of have fleece on the inside. They were the winter version. So yeah, Joy, you'd, you'd be impressed with those. Those are pretty fancy uh, tabby. Yeah, I love the tabby socks. You know, like uh, if I'm wearing geta or something with my kimono or yukata, I always get the tabby socks. But I, I always admire the workers' tabby boots. And I think if I ever do any serious work in my garden, I'll have to get some. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you should. They're really comfortable. And the really great thing about them is that your pants actually go into the boot there. And then the boot really tightly kind of closes around it. And so no dirt gets in there, which is the best thing because, you know, what's worse than having a whole bunch of stones and dirt like in your shoe when you're trying to work? It doesn't work out. But that literally never happens when you're wearing the tabby. It's really nice. That's nice. Uh, just a shout out to your beautiful YouTube channel as well. And oh. I noticed your most popular or most viewed uh, video is yeah. about the 1200 sacred statues. Yeah. That just looks incredible. Yeah, that video got some traction somehow. I don't know. It's been really hard to grow my YouTube. Maybe I'm not as consistent as no, I should be, but time. Yeah, yeah, it does take sure. time and a lot of posting and, uh, but that one, yeah, that's the, the trailer to my, um, the second online experience that I created and it's of a temple who, where there's 1200 of these amazing statues. Uh, it's very surreal for me. It's one of the most unique spaces in all of Kyoto. I actually led a session of this this morning at 5 AM, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful place. And um, because it's a little bit out of the area, it's in the Arashiyama area, but it's a little bit kind of up in the foothills. And so uh, a lot of folks don't go up there, surprisingly. I, I guess before COVID, it was getting a little bit popular on Instagram. You could see it's a very uh, photogenic site. But because it's about an almost an hour walk from the very famous bamboo forest, not a lot of people go up there. And uh, it has an amazing story. Uh, the head monk of the temple is super kind. He's a, an amazing musician, a very modern monk. He himself has a YouTube channel uh, where you can listen to dozens of his songs. A uh, really awesome space. I love that when you are walking around a beautiful traditional city like Kyoto in Japan, and you can hear just by chance, you can start to hear some of the morning chants. Uh, it's just such a magical time to be walking around before it gets busy, totally. before you have the modern city vibe. You mm. have that traditional vibe that is so rare and special. Yeah, that's Kyoto. Yeah, and as you're walking, you feel that you smell the, the, the aroma of tea, someone making tea in a nearby house. And yeah, there's some really, yeah, early morning in Kyoto is the best time, I think, to walk around. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and even in Kyoto, it does get too busy at times. So yes. taking back streets is always my tactic to avoid the crowds. Yeah, I totally recommend that. But I'll tell you, Joy, it, it became a little bit popular before the pandemic to to bash Kyoto and talk about how it's a touristic Disneyland. And, and I know that in certain kind of tourism circles, it has this kind of I don't know, negative image, it may be, maybe not. I, I don't know how folks see it outside of here. But as a resident of here, you know, I absolutely love living here. And I, I know, of course, this place, uh, uh, it can be very touristic depending on where you go. But with that being said, there's like over a thousand years of history here. So there's also many, 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 many places that no one bothers going to. And you could really have, you know, very deep uh kind of unique, authentic experiences and not feel like, you know, it's just a, a tourist trap. And so I, I really do 
recommend anyone coming here just search deeper than just what you could quickly find on Google and and really you know don't discount anywhere a place that you might see and might look on the map and be like oh why would I go there like just check it out it'll probably be awesome yeah good yeah. advice uh, thanks for joining Robert Yellen of oh. Robert Yellen Yakimono Gallery in Kyoto. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to have you here with us live. And Chris, we can. Chris is actually based in Colorado, and you were oh. doing your garden training in Colorado, yeah. right? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I wonder. Can we communicate with them? I wonder, Chris, where you're at. Uh, he might listen, and then he'll write us a comment. Oh, right so we might find out. Um, oh, oh Denver. Denver. There you nice. go. <laughs> yeah, I was living in Denver for a while, for most of my time in, in Colorado. I uh, also stayed up in Aspen for a little bit doing work. Spent a lot of time in Boulder as well. That's incredible to me to find out that there's Japanese Zen gardens in Colorado that you were working at. Oh, what yeah. A so that was that's a really rare situation. But yeah, yeah. Uh, the owner of that company, uh, a person named Martin Mosko, uh, actually came to Japan, I don't know, some 40 plus years ago and studied uh, Zen here and really got into the gardens. And so went back to Colorado and made his own garden company and his own Zen temple. Uh, and uh, when I was looking to get into this field, and I could see Chris asked which school I went to, I went to the University of Colorado at Denver, uh, the grad program there. But when I found the grad program and then I found Martin's company, I thought, I got to go to Colorado. <laughs> that's the place to be. And so that's how I, I ended up out there. And yeah, there are some mind boggling uh, Japanese style gardens in Colorado. Now, I'll tell you, the climate is like completely different than that Denver. I'm sorry, than Kyoto. And so, of course, many of the plants we would use in a garden here cannot be used there. Uh, one of the Good major point. ones, you know, is the moss, which could never grow in Denver. Wow. Uh, so you have to find substitutes. And as you substitute some of the plants, you know, there becomes a little bit of a different feel, maybe you could say, but still, you know, the, you could still use the design principles, the techniques. And, and yeah, I got to work at some unbelievable sites. Uh, unbelievable. Awesome. Uh, Andrew, I think this might be a good time to give us a little tour. Sam. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Let so just to introduce, this is the kind of online immersion virtual Zen garden tour that Andrew has been doing, especially since coronavirus. But I think even after the COVID uh, stay at home social distance time, mm. I think he still has so much relevance to have these kind of virtual tours for people who can't visit in person. But even if you can, I think the the video quality, the sounds, everything that you capture in such pristine quality, it's really hard to replicate in person. Wow. So there is an argument for keeping this virtual aspect of the tours, right, Andrew? Totally. And 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 you really said a lot there you know i um i had never done any of this kind of work before the pandemic uh with the pandemic my tour work was just completely wiped out and i had to keep my business going you know i have uh two kids uh, an amazing wife and just we got to keep living and i didn't want to just give up my business and try to find a job in some company i felt that would have been very meaningless and so i just picked up a camera and i started filming and um I was making really bad videos at first, <laughs> but I got down some of the techniques. I was able to purchase a, a little bit of a better camera and a stabilizer, and I started making these videos and and doing these online um, experiences. And and I've come to, you know, call them, you know, more than just an online experience. I don't really think that explains very much. I like to refer to them as these uh, interactive, immersive, online, live performance documentaries. And I know that's a lot of words all strung together, but the idea is that I'm not just showing places. Uh, I'm I'm telling much deeper stories with these with with in the in the surrounded in in these spaces, and um, by the end of it, you know, 
it could almost seem like a meditation in itself to take part in one of these sessions. You know, I think they're very calming, very um, educational in a certain way. And um, yeah, long after COVID, I want to keep doing this, uh, developing these, because uh, I think it's an amazing way to transmit culture uh, to people all around the world, as long as you have the internet. So Absolutely. I guess I'll start sharing here. Yeah, go ahead. And I think we figured out that the sound wasn't working as good uh, with my um, microphone on. So I'm going to actually take off my headset here. All right. I'll make it full screen here. Konchi in. I can I can see it, Andrew, but I can't hear you. Yeah, can't hear anything. It looks beautiful, but we need to hear your guide, your voice. Definitely, I think you can. Oh, hear I can hear you now. Okay, cool. Okay, very good. So up until this point, you know, this is not the beginning of my um, Zen Garden experience. I would have been. Uh, I give a, a lot of intro. Um, to what we're about to do, but because we're doing the much shorter version here, I, I'm just kind of skipping right to the sub temple we're about to visit. This is a place called Conchi Inn, and uh, this is kind of like my spirit home, I would say. Uh, it's just in a, a wonderful garden, and I've been here probably over four or five hundred times, you know, on tours, walking tours with my family alone. Um, and this is where we're going to enter now. And I'll tell you, during opening hours, you could purchase a ticket. You could walk all around here on your own. I'll tell you, almost nobody does that because on the rankings of places to visit here in Kyoto, this is down in the 90s. <laughs> so, you know, most folks don't come here. It's always very, very quiet, uh, peaceful. And this is the space. This is Konchi Inn. Um, the gate that we just saw in that previous photo is at the bottom right, and we're going to kind of go through the gate and, you know, typically in this session, we would make our, our way all the way around the grounds of the temple. Uh, we usually stop for an intermission here, and then we continue to the main hall, looking out at the main garden, uh, in my opinion, one of the absolute power spots of Kyoto. Uh, it's quite a big facility, my well, goodness. It, it does look kind of big in this image. I think most temple paintings kind of portray themselves as a little bit bigger than what they might actually be. They, there's a sign at the um, ticket office that you can walk around this in like 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, which you could literally just walk around probably in five minutes if you didn't really stop at all. I'll tell you, maybe uh, when, you, when you're walking here, you might take 10, 15 minutes, then you might get to the main prayer hall, uh, have a seat or, or stand and look out for another 10 minutes. So maybe the average time to be here is maybe 20 to 30 minutes. Um, when I'm doing my walking tour here, we're here for about 45 minutes to an hour because we're going in much more detail. But uh, as we zoom in here, we're here in the entrance garden. And uh, we walk forward, we turn this way, uh, and we come to a second gate. Now, as we're standing here, this is what we see. Uh, if we were to meet, let's say, with the head monk, we would come into this building here. But we're actually going to continue this way. We see uh, the pine tree in the near distance. That's actually this tree. And this is a tree which many viewers of this might have in their neighborhood. Uh, this is a uh, just a standard pine tree. <laughs> but it, the pine trees probably don't look like this in your neighborhood because here in Japan, they're cropped every year. They're cut to appear as if they're blowing on the mountaintops in the wind over hundreds of years. Uh, we see this element quite a bit in the garden and we see the emptiness all around us already. Emptiness is a key aspect of, of Zen practice and it's certainly uh, a key aspect of Japanese garden design, which I typically get into a bit later. Uh, for now though, how about we skip ahead <laughs> and come, you know, I'm not even, I think for now, 
We're not gonna watch this opening segment. Let's watch the next segment, I think. Might be a better one because um, okay. this first video has a little bit of intro feeling to it. And, and I'd like to just get you guys into the garden. So I'm gonna click ahead a little bit. That uh, branch, the way the branch is designed reminds me of some of the old wood, wood bullock prints that you would see in Japan oh, totally. with the the moon and the clouds oh, yeah, and yeah. that same kind of beautiful like horizontal shape. I love that, the reaching out yeah, of that, the branch. And that specific tree in, the, in that previous video, which we didn't just watch, but the very base of that tree is a very long horizontal branch uh, that's propped up with a, a few posts um, you really can start to tell the, the age of that tree. I mean, that tree is said to be over 600 years old. Uh, wow. one of the, uh, original trees of that garden. Um, but for now, we've come into the pond garden space. And when we stand here, we look out and see uh, a bridge which leads to an island in the pond. And when we stand here, this is what we see, and, and this is a wonderful example of how very often the Japanese garden is a microcosm of a much larger space. We're going to see that in just a moment. Uh, this is also an amazing example of how perspective is used in the garden. We will get to that in just a bit, but when we look down, we can see the koi and the turtle. These are both uh, animals that live very long, and so they represent longevity and good health. And they also have even deeper meanings, which uh, eventually we get to a little bit later on. Uh, but looking out, we can see the bridge, um, which we just saw in the painting. Um, the bridge, well, you may know in Buddhism, there's a uh, belief in being reborn again after this life. One can be reborn into one of multiple realms of existence. And so very often the bridges represent leaving one realm and crossing into another. And so, you know, whenever I'm in a garden, I see a bridge, I feel it's kind of a mysterious moment, or especially if I cross over one, you know, you definitely know you're doing something important <laughs> in that moment. Um, actually, no, let's take a moment and uh, have a look at this space. So I hope this is showing up clearly on the screen here for you guys. Um, for me, yeah, it's looking totally good. Uh, very soon, we're going to be seeing a waterfall, and that's back in this left corner. Now, as we look across here, our view kind of adjusts downward. We, we connect with the water. And this waterfall we're about to see, we could actually imagine the mountain is a huge mountain far in the distance. We can see it here. The water's crashing down the mountain. It's rushing down the river and opening in, into the ocean in front of us. So we can see that what we're actually standing in front of now is, is a miniature version of all of the natural world. Now, as we pan across, the Tory Gate comes into our view. Uh, the Tori mark the entrance into the sacred space of a shrine. And there's actually a shrine on that small island in the pond. The shrines are where people pay homage to the Shinto spirits that exist all around us in nature. Now, see the lovely koi. In just a moment, we are going to be seeing the lily pads. And you can see them here. The lilies are very, uh, a very deep symbol in, in, in Buddhism. The, the, the roots are at the base of the, the pond where it's dark and it's dirty and it's murky. And from that dirty, dark area grows this beautiful flower. That is representing how us as humans are living in the murky human world and by following the way of the Buddha, grow up into a very beautiful existence.
And so <laughs> that's the very beautiful pond garden. And, and typically at this point in, my, uh, in the, one of these sessions, um, like I do very often through these sessions, we open it up for discussion. I ask my guests, you know, now that we've spent, uh, typically at this point, we would have seen several videos up until this point. I ask my guests, how do they feel uh, about this space? Any reactions, any elements that have stood out to them, any impressions, or if they have any questions um, to, to definitely, you know, share them. And, and we have a little bit of a discussion and then we continue on uh, to the next space. And so, we had a few comments. Uh, oh, yeah. Kat Rina from Facebook says, this yeah. is so beautiful, how I miss Japan. And Sue says, this is absolutely beautiful. And for me as well, I'm intrigued how you were able to video with just the sounds of nature, no sounds of people, wow. no sounds of traffic or anything. It's just a magical video. Well, I love it. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, video, film, videoing, you know, filming has become a tremendous passion of mine now. And I had never done any of this before uh, the pandemic. Um, I think, though, being a garden designer myself somehow allows me to film in maybe a different way than what most people might film. I, I try to show these gardens the way that I see them. And so that's how I try to film them and edit them. You know, you see the whole view, you pan back and forth, you go in and out, you see things again after you've seen them once already because that's how you would experience something. And um, so that's how I try to create these, uh, these gardens. I, um, uh, I'm sorry, the videos. Now the sound you, you mentioned is also probably one of the most difficult aspects of creating these videos because you have wind, you have nearby construction, uh, you may have, you know, cars in the background, but this is actually pretty far away from any street, so the cars aren't a big problem. Um, it's typically wind. Uh, it could be people, but uh, this garden is very quiet, so we don't really have people sound. Um, but yeah, the editing of the sound does take a lot, and 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 often I mix in music, which in this video I didn't, but um, there's also uh, sounds of, of Japanese music to really get my viewers, my guests closer to Japan. Yeah. Oh, I could see Marianne. Can we, yeah, Marion uh, said that she just signed up for a tour, oh, even awesome. though she lived in Japan for 25 years. That's wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much, Marianne. Can we continue to another part of the yeah, yeah, have definitely. a little bit more? Yeah, 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 definitely. So uh, after we have a little bit of a discussion, we continue on to the Moss Forest. And uh, we, I call it the moss forest because you can see in the photo, it's just covered in moss. And um, there's over a thousand different types of moss, they say, in Japan. Uh, there's about seven or eight different varieties in this space alone. And, and so I talk a little bit about the moss typically here. I talk also about the pathways. And uh, since I can see Marianne's going to be joining sometime soon, I don't want to give don't want to give too much away now, so I'll just keep it at that. But I do talk about the pathways, the moss, um, and then I point out uh, a little bit about what's known as komorebi. Komorebi is the, the beauty that's created when the light filters through the trees and projects onto the ground. A komorebi is very ephemeral. You know, imagine if the, the, the clouds come over the sun, the komorebi is gone. And so uh, it's something I think people in Japan, you know, really like to notice and 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 spend time uh, seeing. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll walk through the space now, see if you could spot uh, the Komorebi. So we are now coming away from the pond area and entering into the forest. 
And I think immediately you can see it's a very well-maintained forest. Uh, without daily maintenance, the garden would never look like this. And as we talked about earlier, you know, this was historically the work of the monks as part of their um, spiritual training. Now, because the number of monks has diminished so greatly, um, they still are working in the gardens, but a lot of this work is actually done by groundskeepers or professional garden companies. Virtually every temple has a contract with a professional garden company. As you can see throughout these videos, often I'm narrating over the video, but then I don't really say much at all and just let the nature sounds come through. We've come to the next gate and uh, connected to the gate. The wall here has these roof tiles with the family crest of one of the most powerful people in the history of Japan printed on those tiles. And um, typically next, I, I tell a little bit about that. Yeah, but before we do that, I typically open it up again and we have a little bit of a discussion about moss. You know, I think a lot of folks are really interested in moss and love to see it. And, and especially on my walking tours, love to spend time around it and touch it and do whatever. So that usually opens up a, a chance to talk about the moss a little bit before we move on. When I was in a, a, a Japanese forest recently with lots of moss, you could feel the difference in temperature. Yeah, It was a hot summer day, but next to the moss was so cool. It was amazing, like a natural refrigerator. Yeah. Yeah, it's really amazing. And a lot of folks think it's so, you know, brittle and kind of, you know, delicate, but it's actually really strong. It, many of the varieties, I mean, it doesn't really like trample, being trampled all day, every day by people, but it is very, uh, it does really endure. And, you know, even in Kyoto, when it's hot here during the summer, it's like, you know, 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius and, and, and humidity is like top. It's really hot, but there's still uh, moisture in the air and we get rain and the moss, you know, can even get kind of brown and a little bit even crunchy. But um, as soon as it rains, it comes back to being green. And uh, the moss actually takes the water in through its head. And so it's been, it's funny, <laughs> Joy, there's been times where I'm on a walking tour and it's really hot and the moss is all red and brown when we walk in, but then there's a downpour. <laughs> And as we're leaving, the same spots that we were seeing as brown moss are now, you know, bright green. I mean, it literally turns back to being green almost. Wow. Again. It happens that quickly. Yeah. I wanted to also ask about the season of the videos that you're showing. Is this summer? Uh, um, I didn't see too many autumn colors or spring colors. Is this a summer version? Yeah. So that's really funny. Uh, the first thing I learned when doing online uh, experiences like this is like the videos are kind of become like your iPhone. Like the minute you buy it, <laughs> it's outdated because the gardens are always changing. And so <laughs> I can't be going out there like every two weeks and like recording all the, the smaller changes. But um, yeah, that became a, a thing to, to maintain. And so um, what we're seeing now, uh, because we're now getting to the beginning of autumn, well, I guess we now it is kind of, well, I guess beginning of autumn, but you know, I've been showing the summer version um, for a while. And so next we're gonna see the hydrangea typically. And I'm still showing that because I try to show almost like what the, the best part of each garden, uh, each space. And so, you know, the, the, the lilies that we just saw in the pond uh, aren't really much there anymore. The hydrangea, which we would see next, aren't really there anymore. But until the autumn colors start happening, I show that version. Once the autumn starts, I show the autumn version pretty much all the way through winter. Because even though I love the gardens in the winter, you know, the gardens of the leaves fall and, and you know, it's very clean and clear. I think visually people would prefer to see something more dramatic. And so I show the autumn version pretty much through winter, uh, about till spring almost. Hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, that's okay. I think yeah, I think we have time for one more short little guided okay. tour. Can you show us another part? 
Sure. Um, how about, we'll just continue on this walk here. Uh, so next, what we're going into is a shrine. And the shrine is up above in the top left corner. What we're walking through here is the entrance garden of the shrine. And even just the design layout is kind of interesting. Um, why it's kind of a, a zigzag path as opposed to just a straight path. But uh, maybe I won't give that away too soon here. Um, let's now just walk through this space. But before I, I, I mention, the shrine is actually dedicated to this person um, who was Tokugawa Ieyasu, uh, a very powerful samurai in the, the early 1600s who unified Japan. And so when he died, 500 shrines were made all over Japan to commemorate him. And this is one of those shrines. And so now we're gonna be walking through the entrance garden of uh, the shrine. Now, we had the hydrangea. Uh, before that, there was azaleas. Before that, there were rhododendron. Uh, coming soon, there's gonna be autumn leaves. And so you can see the garden is planned to have interest throughout the year. You know, in the, in the, in the, in the summer when it's very, very hot, it's just very green. Uh, again, in the winter, you know, there's uh, a chance to see uh, again, the, the moss, the evergreens, the stones really come alive in the winter, I would say. Um, here we see the hand washing basin typically wash your hands before um, entering a shrine. Now this garden is a little bit, this part of the, the temple garden is a little bit more showy than other parts of the garden because this is really dedicated to the shogun. So, you know, typically flowers are not a major part of the Japanese garden. But you can say that here, they, they kind of are in this space. We're now crossing underneath another Tori gate. Uh, typically, you would bow before crossing through there. That really marks the entrance into the sacred space of the spirits. This is a plant that's blooming now. It's known as hagi. It's one of my favorites. It's, it's one of the plants, one of the only plants in the garden I feel that's just allowed to grow wild and do its thing complete, completely free. Everything else is cropped here to keep this very clean shape. And now we'll see the garden space to our left and then the garden space next to our right. Then with just a few more steps, uh, we approach the next gate. And once we cross that next gate, we are into the shrine dedicated to Tokugawa Ieyasu. Great. So actually at this point, I, I do usually talk a little bit about the stone lanterns because we did see many of them in that space. Uh, we can see smaller informal ones like we see here. We see much taller, more geometric formal ones here. And then I, I go into, you know, the difference between the two and why you would choose one as opposed to the other. Uh, but I hope anyone watching this might tune in sometime, join a session, and then kind of get the full version. <laughs> That'd be really so nice. Is it, it's not just functional or aesthetic. There's deeper meaning there. Um, well, no, it's very much functional and aesthetic, as you mentioned. Um, you know, historically, a uh, candle would have been placed in these lanterns. It would have been a, a functioning light in the evenings. Um, but just why you would choose, like, let's say this lantern for your space. Okay, let's just do this, like, kind of in your mind. Imagine this lantern was in this space, and this lantern, okay, if we go back to this space, and then imagine this small little guy was in this space. <laughs> I don't know. It, if that would feel weird to you. But I think if you spend time a lot in gardens, that would be really strange, I think, in a certain sense. Um, so yeah, there's reasons why you put certain lanterns in certain spaces. That's really interesting. I never thought about that. 
yeah. something well, to think about in my next temple garden visit. <laughs> well, uh, okay, so uh, since you're interested, I'll tell you, it really has to do with the scale of the space and the formality of that space. So you can see here, this is a really informal space. It's kind of like the opening of a forest. And so the lantern kind of looks like a mushroom that you'd find in a forest. Um, it's quite small too. It's only about chest high. Uh, now, as we turn around and we're now facing the shrine, uh, it's a very uh, uh, formal space. The lantern becomes much taller, more geometric. The, the capstone is actually mimicking the roof line of the building. And so there's much more of a kind of much better works together here than let's say if you planted this little guy here, that would be quite bizarre, especially with the scale of the wall behind it. Um, so yeah, a lot of scale issues, a lot of formality issues going into the, the, the placements of the different lanterns. That makes sense. And yeah. you also mentioned before about the use of open space. This is a concept I often see in Japanese design, in paintings, in ikebana, in so yeah. many Japanese arts, right? Yeah, yeah. unlimited uh, open space, you know, known as ma in Japanese um, is a visible in really any of the Japanese arts. You know, Japanese art is known as being simple or uh, kind of minimal. And what that really is, is uh, having a lot of emptiness in that space, not cluttering it with all different kinds of elements. This really goes all the way back to Zen practice. Ma is said to be the, the, the physical manifestation of something called Mu. <laughs> And Mu is the direct experience of Zen itself. When you are uh, experiencing pure present mind, um, typically when a monk is med meditating or anyone's meditating is when you experience Mu. And in that mind, you, you feel uh, this unlimited potential, this anythingness, like, like you yourself have, have unlimited potential. And so that feeling was brought out into the design world, into the empty space, where instead of seeing it as nothingness, as you could see it as this space of, of unlimited energy. Um, yeah, it's really wow. powerful. That's really cool. And of course, Marie Kondo, who has become so famous for decluttering America, um, she is talking about getting rid of things that don't give you joy. And that might be the idea of emptiness and, and happiness from space as well, right? Yeah, totally. And I can see a really interesting comment here by Barbara uh, mentioning how the lanterns represent the five spaces. Uh, and actually what you're mentioning, um, Barbara, are that doesn't uh, connect with the lanterns really, but with something called Gorinto. Those are um, five, those are typically memorial stones that have um, five stones, which represent those elements that you you just mentioned in your comment. So well, thank interesting. you for that comment. We, we only have a few more minutes, yeah. Andrew. This time has gone so fast. It's such yes. a magical journey with you. Um, yeah. Is there anything we haven't talked about yet that you'd like to well, mention? Maybe I, I would just like to, to just- event, right? Well, if I could just tell the audience about, you know, the other two uh, online experiences I, I lead, I think um, I think uh, anyone tuning in might really like them. If you kind of liked what you saw here, this is the first one that I produced. And from making this, I definitely learned a lot. Then I produced the second one with the 1200 uh, stone statues that we touched on earlier. But since making that one, I've now made my latest uh, experience known as Sakamoto and the Monks of Hyezan. And I don't know if it's possible to show that in any, yeah, there you go. Oh, that's actually coming up. Uh, next week, right? Yeah, next week. Um, and maybe, I don't know if there's any way to show my website, Joy. Do you have that? Yes. Um, I, I can that? share the page and show it. Okay. Um, and you're also on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn okay. and YouTube, right? Yep, all of those. And the way my, here, I'm gonna maybe just switch over. Can I do this? Uh, so this is your on. website. Oh yeah, there you go. Uh, and let me go to the top. 
Yeah, if you go to the online to the, the, online. To the top page there, right on the on the the website, you could see um, there's a narrated video uh, that I've done of a, one of my favorite sites here. But when you scroll down, you could see uh, links. Yeah, a place called Rakushisha. When you go down, you could see um, the three different uh, experiences that I lead. Uh, when you go into each one of those pages, there's a trailer, there's a description, there are um, a lot of information. Going all the way down to the bottom of that page, you can actually see the links to all of my social media. Unfortunately, this template that I use for my website, uh, here's some of my walking tour information, but my this template has the social uh, media links all the way at the bottom, which is kind of hard to see, but there they are. So anyone interested to connect, I'd love to 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 connect with you and uh, yeah fantastic thank you so much andrew yeah thank you Joy. A, really a wonderful fun. little preview into the great work that you're doing oh thank you so much joy and the great work you're doing because i just kind of stumbled upon you you know a couple months ago and i was so impressed that how you have a show <laughs> all the work that must go into doing that i just uh then to be able to come on so quickly, I really appreciate the, the chance. Oh, it's fabulous to talk with you and to learn, like Marion said, uh, even after 25 years, she's going to sign up for your tour and learn more, you know, because even people like us who have lived in Japan for so long, there's still so much we can learn. Mm -hmm. So it's fantastic what you're doing. Keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you so much, Joy. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Great comments and questions today. And definitely sign up for a tour. You can find Andrew William once again through And Design Kyoto, his own website. I'll put the links below. He's also on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Everyone, have a great day and a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joy. Take care, everyone. Be safe out there. Bye.